Please be seated. Good morning. Father Stephen and I were talking last week about the scene in this morning's gospel. It's a great story. Different versions tell us there may have been one or two men, fierce by one description, possessed by unclean spirits and demons, roaming the mountains, the wild, mostly the tombs, sometimes without clothing, apparently unhoused, broken shackles and chains in tow, howling and out of his mind, isolated from family, home, and community. When Jesus stepped out of his boat, he instantly recognized in them a desire for liberation and commanded the unclean spirits to come out. They recognized him as the Son of God and called him out as well. The demons asked Jesus not to torment them when he replaces them, not to send them back to the abyss. And it's interesting to note that Jesus did not cast the demons into the nearby pigs as I thought I'd remember the story. The demons simply asked Jesus if they could go there, sort of negotiating their own exit. And Jesus gave them permission to do so. So they went on their own. Was he having compassion on them as well? It's hard to say. But once the pigs are in possession of the unclean spirits and demons, they quickly charge down a steep bank into the sea or lake, and they perish. This driving out of evil spirits from person or places is something that Jesus and his disciples did now and then. The last time Jesus did this, it was in a Jewish community, his community, in a synagogue. This time it's among the Gentiles, demonstrating the open nature of the kingdom, this new thing that God is doing, and that it is for everyone. In Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus calls his 12 followers together to send them out, Among other powers and instructions, he gives them power over evil spirits. He told them to force demons out of people. He said, I give you these powers freely, so help others freely. I wonder if we believe that we have also been empowered to be exorcists. Our Episcopal Book of Occasional Services does not provide a right for our use, but it does provide guidelines. And we pray across our liturgies together to be delivered from evil and temptation. Father Jonathan once preached a lovely and compassionate sermon about mental wellness and anxiety and the possibility that some of these possessions were simply and seriously in that camp. In these modern times, many of us would prefer not to believe that there is a specific kind of energy out there working against us. But we do need to remain mindful of those forces that seem to get in us, to get on us. We or those we love can seem trapped in clouds or spirits of addiction, shackled by racism, or many other fears that drive them, that drive us away from our communities. Even anger and grief can do that. In the best of times, these death-dealing energies and clouded spirits can be managed. I would be lying if I said I didn't know my demons. Of course, I know them. I know their names. I know how they take their coffee. On my best days, I command them to sit tight. So together, they play cards in the attic, smoke their cigarettes, and complain about the weather. But on the bad days, on the tired, sad, and scared days, When the lies and the fear get a little too close, they threaten to be the weather. 
Now, I am a big fan of confronting head on that which threatens us. Like that stunning moment in the movie, I'm not sure if anyone remembers it anymore, but it stays with me, the beasts of the southern wild. There's this moment when Hush Puppy finally stops running and she turns to confront the mythical giant boars of her nightmares, the aurochs. We can command them to stop, to be silent, to leave even. Maybe not cast them into another or send them down a riverbank, but I'm okay with that. But on our bravest days, they can be replaced, tamed. Maybe in a loving circle of folding chairs in a church basement, or over a cup of coffee with a friend, or pushed out of our pores through music, exercise, screaming at concerts, making art, telling stories, escaping through books, poetry, and dance, by saying our prayers, by marching for a cause, being in relationships, in community, and doing the work of standing steady, all letting others hold us when we are unable. This calms us and replaces those energies and can restore us. Which brings us back to today's story. People from the surrounding farms and towns came running when they heard the news. What happens next is something that smells a little like the first recorded incident of NIMBY, or the not in my backyard syndrome. You see, they believed everything was fine. This person out in the tombs was theirs to live with. They had tried a few things which didn't work. They believed he had been managed, at least to the degree that it was only mildly inconvenient to them. They might have had to bypass a certain route coming from the seaside now and then to avoid this person, but otherwise it was fine. Fine for them. The man seemed only to pose a threat to himself. But now, thousands of pigs have perished, and they find this person fully restored. This man they had given up on, sitting there calmly, fully clothed, now back in his right mind, his humanity and his dignity restored. He's talking with Jesus and making plans to go and tell others that there is healing and liberation to be had in this land, to be had for everyone. But in restoring the peace to the broken man, Jesus had disturbed the peace of the locals. Feeling challenged and afraid, they want to be rid of Jesus. You see, we are comfortable mostly with our neighborhoods, our distractions, our commutes, and our inconveniences. With the living conditions of those who we, through our tax dollars and prayers and volunteer work, we would like to believe we are doing our best to help. Those we as a society might sometimes prefer to avoid eye contact with, like the young people standing in the medians, whose problems obviously exceed any resources or healing that we may individually possess. Some might even believe that with all that has been attempted on their behalf, that maybe they are choosing their own isolation. But Jesus did not seem interested in how it was that the man in the tombs came to be so entirely separated from himself and his community. Nor did Jesus spend any time accusing the town folk once they arrived for the man's condition. He simply saw that he needed to be liberated from his oppression and restored to the community. When we see people oppressed or outcast due to their residential status or age or limited education or employment or any number of reasons, we are reminded in today's story that we are all in this land made in the image of God, worthy of God's liberation and love. This story encapsulates the whole of the gospel which is to not be afraid, to do the difficult, sometimes dangerous work of advancing Jesus' message of love, of resurrection, to risk this adventure 
this work of restoration and to push peace directly into the destruction. We are empowered by this example to be liberated ourselves, to cast off the fear and longing that keeps us among the dead, to bravely step out and find a community to replace our loneliness, and to be that community releasing others, spreading the good news of peace and liberation to all. Let's pray. God, we ask for your grace and your help in casting away all that keeps us from receiving and sharing your love. Amen. <laughs>